Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all you members of the TSB Nation. I'm Rustin Edwards, based in Geneva, with my illustrious boiling hot comrade in arms, Mr. Matt Stanley. Morning, morning, morning. I'm flattered. Boiling hot. Wow. Well, that's just more reference to the high temperatures in the UAE. Oh. Anything else. Oh. What was it, like 65 degrees there? That's centigrade. Uh, no, no. Uh, 62 today, actually. So, <laughs> no, it's... Is is hot. It's going to get to forty six today. Apparently, if only I had a cold beer or beverage. Other, you know, don't have to have a beer, but I like, you know, um, and a swimming pool. Um, but no, it's good. I mean, look, it's I did. It's funny though because yeah, it's it's hot. It's hardly breaking news. Oh look, Middle East in hot summer shocker. It's not really, is it? It's it's pretty consistent. Um, but I did listen the other day on the radio that. Um, April in the Middle East was the coolest for 25 years. Wow. I know. Take that, Greta. Take that <laughs> up your up your renewable argument and you know, I don't know. I don't, she'll probably moan, she should probably say, Yeah, see, I told you. Climate, climate change is it, getting change. hotter and colder. Yeah, they're gonna be growing grass in the middle of the Sahara pretty soon. So look out. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, exactly. We won't be camels, there'll be cows. <clears throat> we'll have alpine fields like where you are. No, no, it's um it suddenly creeps up in you and then bang, it's uh, it's very hot. But that's all right. It's like I said, you, you know, we're coming into June now. Um, the football season is over. Thank God. I feel like it went on for a long time this year. Um, so we're going to sit back and watch cricket? Yeah. A proper game. A proper game <laughs> for clever people. Not really. You just hit a ball into a crowd and drink beer. Again, beer. Second reference in five minutes. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> It's not like it's, coming up a long holiday weekend. Oh, wait. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, happy yeah, Memorial Day. Yes, they have Memorial Day. It was UK Bank Holiday as well. And what does Memorial the, Day mean for everyone in the oil market, Edwards? Well, you also had Whit Monday in Europe. So you had you had you had the trifecta of Europe, UK, and the US all having a holiday this week, a three-day weekend this weekend. Yeah, which was annoying because and anyone else who was asking questions about the oil market, I mean, I'm, I was the only person who could answer them. So <laughs> I was really busy. No, it was fine. But what does what does Memorial Day mean for the oil market, Edward? Well, that means gasoline season. Let's see what happens with gasoline demand. Um, uh, that's going to yeah, be the big does. question mark that everybody's going to be watching for. And I think you know that that type of information rolls out in the EI data this week and next week because it does take a couple of weeks for that data to filter through the system. Yeah. Uh, so usually it's a three week data set. Uh, you have the week prior, the week of, and the week after. Uh, which shows you the incremental demand increase or decrease. So you theoretically, last week, you had all the gasoline stations basically filling up, getting ready for the Memorial Day weekend. Um, the one uh, interesting note on the Memorial Day is that gasoline prices have been ticking up in a yeah. lot of markets across the United States, basically following the stronger gasoline cracks and the stronger moves on the Arbob market. Uh, but nevertheless, so gasoline prices had ticked up about six cents uh, from what I was seeing across the board. Which yep. doesn't sound like a lot. That's six cents a gallon. You know, you fill up your SUV that guzzles up uh, you know, 50 gallons every 10 miles and voila. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where's my where's my stat time bell? Ding-a-ling, stat time. <laughs> uh, this is from our good friend Kevin Wright, who uh, wrote a good, very good piece recently on gasoline demand and what it means. Um, U.S. demand growth driven by dr summer driving season. Yep. U.S. balance to tighten significantly over the summer. Stocks are at 220 million barrels. 6% below the five-year average. Um, and the US this year is expected to resume importing gasoline after high uh, after a hiatus of 18 months. There you go. ding a -ling, it's that time. It's, it's interesting when they look at it from a five-year average because I, I, I like to pull away from the five. When I look at my data, I don't want to look at what happened during COVID because during COVID, we had a massive increase in stocks across the board. But you can't just ignore what happened during COVID. Well, you can't ignore it. But the fact that you build up a lot of stocks because demand went almost to nil, it does drive the the idea of, um, you know, what stock levels we had uh, for five years saying, oh, my God, we're, we're well below the five-year average. However, when you look at the five-year average pre-COVID from 2015 to 2019, gasoline stocks in the United States averaged 233 million barrels. Uh, so far for 2023, we're at 229 million barrels. Yeah, we've got it as we've got it as 220, 220. That's what we've got. Um, 
No, look, I, I, I agree with you. COVID obviously was literally the spanner in the works. Um, but you you need a prism. You need some kind of reference point back to on, on, on a data point. But 2015, 2019, it was, we're lower than that. But we still see demand lower now than pre-pandemic levels. And I think that if you're going to take one thing, one takeaway from those 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 data points that Kev made, I think it's that, you know, for me, that's the overriding, um, you know, data point is that demand is still below pre-pandemic levels. Well, and, and if you look at demand versus day coverage, you're sitting right now at about 25 days coverage in the United States, which is the average days coverage mm. for gasoline. So it's not like showing any massive shortfall or any massive increase. I mean, the one point that a lot of gasoline traders look at is add one. Now, when you look yeah. at when you look at inventory data in the United States, it's divided into five different pads, and the pads are basically Petroleum Administration defense districts. Yeah. It harkens back to the Cold War when the United States measured the gasoline or oil inventories around the United States divided up into different sectors. In the case of a nuclear war, a nuclear attack, they can understand how much product was located in one region of the United States versus another region of the United States. So you can rebalance your inventories if, say, New York was hit with a nuclear bomb, as an example. Okay. There you uh, go. So another episode of Russ Does US Politics and History. Stay tuned next week for Lincoln, the real story. <laughs> <laughs> but, but nevertheless, with the administrative defense districts, pad one, which is which is the US East Coast, and it's divided up into three sub pads, nevertheless, is massively short on gasoline. Uh, yeah. mainly you've lost two main refineries in the United States, one that will never come back, the Philadelphia Refining Complex, if you want to roll back, do the, the way back machine back to 2019, had a massive explosion and fire, which basically destroyed the entire complex. Um, yeah. So the U.S. East Coast is missing its local refining and relies fully on imports, mainly to balance the system there now. Um, so you do have that arbitrage flow, which will tie back in later. Stay tuned, <laughs> foreshadowing. As we go deeper into the conversation today. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, you know, that ARB, the EU-US ARB, is, you know, is, is, it, it's always been there. It's been there as long as I've been in the oil market, certainly. TC2 being the freight route. Um, it, you know, the, the, the re-export is something that's picked up recently. I'm not sure that will happen from the Gulf Coast, though. Um but yeah, look, it's it's the the story really there is yeah, trading opportunities are still there, arbitrage flows are still moving, but essentially demand is lower than it was pre-pandemic. That's true. I mean that is, that is something that the IEA or EIA EIEIO no, no, no. <laughs> have been uh, have been talking about recently is that uh, you know there was an estimate that the, the US could be at peak demand for gasoline either this year or next year. Uh, and they, they cite this mainly for the increase in efficiency on the engines that are coming out from the different uh, manufacturers, as well as EV penetration. You know, God bless Elon Musk and the Tesla. Uh, but just, uh, it just needs to go away and go back playing with rockets, that lad. Um, <laughs> because he's if you're a world in the <laughs> energy sector, you can hardly talk. You've got a Tesla. Yes. Come on here talking about your gasoline margins. You drive a bloody electric car. Yes, I did. And, and I still do. And it's a, and it's a beautiful thing. It's do you have range right anxiety? Huh? Do you have range anxiety? No, not at all. <laughs> do you drive it? I do drive it, yes. Um, you know, I drove it up to Belgium and back. Did you? Yes. What did it take you, four and a half days or something? <laughs> That's only the pedals in the back. You know, kids had to keep pedaling to keep the car moving. No, no, I mean, it, it is, it, I, am, I am joking, but it is something... Uh, it, it's it, it's a conversation that will probably be had over the next five or six years. You know, you mentioned no new combustion engines for sale in Europe from 2030, I think. Um, we touched on that last week. It's, uh, I, I don't know, the, the infrastructure just isn't there. And and I know technology is, is improving all the time, but I just, I, I, I don't, I don't see, one is, one is price penetration as well. You know, you, if you're if you're under you know wh wherever you sit on on earning potential or earning capacity, you're not going to be able to afford an electric car. So I think it's still for the privileged few, but the infrastructure certainly in the Middle East, which is building new infrastructure, it's just not there yet for electric vehicles. 
No, but I think I think in the Middle East you'll have a hard time competing with the in, incumbent gasoline supply from the local refiners and local national oil companies. I mean, yeah. they really have no incentive to hurdle back on how much they run and how much gasoline they supply to the local market because hey, gasoline's cheaper than water. Um, you know, that's always the saying about Middle East uh, gasoline prices. Um, yeah. But nevertheless, when you look at other markets such as Europe, as an example, yeah, the infrastructure is being built out. Um, you do have more options around cars for different price points now than you've had in the past. So you can get an electric car for 8,000 euros. Um, yeah, it's a small roundabout or a runabout that you can run around town. At, you, know, you can only get up to 50 or 60 kilometers an hour. But nevertheless, you do have different price points. It can start hitting different um, economic classes of people to uh, make the transition happen. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a good point because Sir Jim Ratcliffe, uh, for those who know, obviously, the richest man in Britain, um, just put a bid in for Manchester United, and is also the proud owner of uh, of, of Ineos, big chemical manufacturer. Um, he also built a car recently uh, called the Ineos Grenadier, which is a fabulous looking thing. It's a cross between a sort of G-Wagon and a Defender. It's like really masculine, you know, like boxy. And he doesn't, that hasn't got an electric car. What we need are more car manufacturers who also own refineries. <laughs> then, then, then the demand argument is fine. <laughs> but speaking of demand, you know, yeah. let's switch our focus back to to, to the, the big demand driver that everybody keeps talking about, China. China, China, China. China. Continues um, to disappoint. It continues to massively disappoint. Industrial profits out over the over the weekend. Uh, if you were if you were busy looking at your data points and not. Uh, uh, sitting by the barbecue, wondering uh, when that rib is going to be done or the, the brisket will be done getting smoked. Um, industrial profits came out on Saturday, down 20.6% year on year in April. Yeah, that's uh, bad. That. Versus I mean, forecast that. of down 18%. I mean, so even your forecasters are showing lower eco uh, industrial profits, which yeah. doesn't bode well for the uh, demand story that everybody keeps talking about. Uh yeah, look, it's, uh, I mean, the China, I'm going to just insert my weekly caveat, which is the the markets are too complacent on Chinese growth and have done and continue to price in disappointment. I would argue, though, that year on year, it's still skewed to that oh, that blessed word COVID. Um, you know, if we're looking at, if we're looking well, at data... You're data, skewing on COVID, but... We're below where it was last year when COVID was far more impactful to the Chinese economy. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying that in order, in order for, in order for there to really be a set of fair data points, I think we'd have to judge economic success once once everything is lifted. Because if you want, if you want a data point, we got non-manufacturing PMI PMI out tomorrow, which is still showing forecasts to show growth above fifty. It's fifty four point nine is forecast. Now well, that that's, be, that's that's service though. That's non manufacturing PMI. Yeah, non manufacturing, yes. Yeah, and and manuf and sorry, and manufacturing PMI tomorrow fifty one point four forecast. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong line here. Uh, fifty one point four forecast, and in last month it was forty nine point two. So it is showing growth. So I, I I me I would say judge it in six months time. Well, the, in the NBS, I, 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 hate to dis, I hate to disagree with you on this, but the NBS has manufacturing PMI forecast currently at 49.8 versus 49.2 last month. Service non-manufacturing at 55, but the general at 54.2. Okay, I've got here, um, and I'm going to argue with you, is manufacturing PMI 51.4 forecast versus 49.2 last month. Okay, but it depends on whose who's forecast you're looking at, I guess, because that's, uh, you know, I have different... I mean, other websites are available. This is investing.com. Ah, okay. I look at a different one. <laughs> well, screw you in your wrong <laughs> websites. No, look, it's, it, it's a conversation, right? This is the whole point. So, <clears throat> and again, I think it's a good point to raise regarding China, what's happening. Is that very, is that very example there? where we've got a difference in opinion, a, a highlight of just how complacent markets have been about China in the past, because we're arguing about the fact, okay, it's a couple of points difference because it's banter or whatever, but last month, 49.2, a reading below 50 shows contraction in, in the market, in, in, the, in the economy. And now it's going to show growth again. Where, where, did, where did the markets translate that? Yeah, well, I think if you, get, if you do get 
growth across all three categories when the data comes out next week or no, I'm sorry, tomorrow. Um, you'll probably take people take that as, oh my God, China's back, happy days, rally, rally, rally. Um, the underlying, but if you don't have the growth across all three, I think the market kind of stays where it is. It doesn't show any real change because the manufacturing sector is the predominant energy consumer within the, within the country. Yeah. Now, the things that are kind of worrying about the Chinese economy is that uh, there was a piece out on CNBC about how Chinese youth unemployment at 20 percent uh, shows a complete mismatch of college graduates and the jobs available for them. So it's showing a lot of underemployment within China for the younger generation, right. uh, which doesn't bode well because that actually hurts your consumer spending. Um, if they can't get the jobs that pay them the nice checks, they're not going to go out and buy the latest iPhone. Uh, they may buy the Samsung Galaxy, but not the iPhone. <laughs> um, the other thing that was interesting about the chain about Chinese demand and data coming up is the fact you do have about two million barrels of refining capacity going offline for the next six to eight weeks yeah. as they start going through the turnaround period. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be a very interesting mix to see how the market responds to that, primarily because you've had um, the Chinese government crack down on the bitumen mix imports into China, yeah, uh, which has basically flip this flip the switch on the high sulfur fuel market in east asia uh because bitumen mix is a crude oil substitute that is put into countries that avoids what the chinese put on consumption tax for crude oil or other products coming in um and usually it's your private smaller refiners that end up buying the bitumen mix because they don't have an allocation of crude supply now if the chinese government has started has started to question the bitumen mix coming in has reduced the amount of the ability for the teapots to import bitumen mix. It basically puts a curtailment on how much they can run outside the con consumption pack tax regime. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see exactly how the export numbers for China pan out and how their actual stocks look as you go into this uh, turnaround period for the next six to eight weeks. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think... <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you. That, that that was quite a surprising story. And these these delays, you know, they're pretty, you know, for for domestic, um, excuse me, for bitumen blend cargoes imported into China, you're talking five, six, seven days. They, they're really they're really inspecting these documents, really inspecting these cargoes. So, um, yeah, enforcement there is quite strict. But I think. If we see domestic consumption increasing in China, I think that that justifies a rally. I think. Uh, a, a, an economic data point like PMIs showing, it, it, you know, showing growth instead of contraction, I think is a fairly weak argument in order to to put risk on. But that's what I mean. I don't think that's. A, I think if you have growth across all three, I think you'll see uh, a lot of funds jump in and buy. Mm, I, I, I would need a signal to uh, uh, CTAs to come in and start purchasing crude futures because oh China's back oh my god it's so good oh my god look at this yeah but last month it showed contraction so I think one reading of that I don't I, to me doesn't justify risk on but I so I, I think you know you got you got festivals coming up in June in China I think it's the Dragon Boat Festival that's always sort of a, a tick up in in domestic travel um so i think once you see something like that so i would say if june starts looking good as well once data comes out in july or at the end of at the end of june then yeah we could we could we could have a look and, and form an argument but i think one reading albeit a few to get that one reading i think is uh is the complacency is a highlights the complacency the market still got about chinese growth yeah, well, I mean, in, in the flip side of the Chinese growth is, you know, when you look at the consumer fuels, you have jet demand is the other one. Uh, I think they have internal jet demand. I mean, your domestic Chinese flights roughly around 5% below pre-COVID levels. Right. But the big missing link on the entire jet demand question is the international travel. Yeah. And that is still lagging well below 2019 levels. I think the latest stat I saw was around 53% below. Um, but we, yeah, so Kev wrote about this in 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 uh, this week as well. Um, we've got global jet fuel demand will grow by fourteen point six percent year on year to seven point one million barrels a day, but that's still one point one million barrels a day below pre pandemic levels. Again, so that's another part of the barrel. <clears throat> you know, gasoline we're seeing demand lower lower than pre COVID. Jet fuel as well, which has went through a brutal time because of the pandemic and is now recovering. Um, but still below pre-pandemic pre in terms of demand. 
Yep, and and the long distance international travel, I think, will be a, a tougher one to return because um, mainly, you know, it depends on how you look at your corporate budgets for for travel. Um, you know, a lot of businesses are not uh, allocating funds to travel as they had in the past, unless you have a real relationship type business where you need to be face to face with your counterpart. You know, a lot of them are. A lot of companies are opting for the the conference call or the Zoom call versus uh, get on a plane and go shake a hand. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it certainly it not one for the tier miles. Um, oh, and it's very important that I go to Bali for a coal conference this week to find out what's going on with power generation fuels. Yeah, I, I kind of think that those those trips have been curtailed, arguably justified. <laughs> but um, I, I'm going there, by the way. Um, no, no. It's it, yeah. Look, it, it, it was a, a, a rebalancing, wasn't it? But. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm not, I don't. I think we said this a while ago. We don't think the jet market will ever get back to ever get back to pre-pandemic levels. But it's it's, it's, it's growing, just not not as as good as it was pre-pandemic. Now, the other interesting thing that um, has popped up, and uh, one point that I, I'd like to talk about is uh, switching our focus from Asia to the Atlantic Basin. Yeah, go on. Yeah, Let's Matt, Matt's about, got yeah. his he's got his fighting dance on, so he's ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> Now, is it, you know, having what, the ability what, to what look are some at what flows you've seen coming out of the Atlantic Basin that uh, are, are piquing your interest here this morning? Yeah, I mean, look, once you know, I'll get my geek on, but it's um, you know, having the ability to look at what's happening with flows, how they're changing, how quickly they're changing. Obviously, the one story that's happened in the last eighteen months, specifically this year, has been what's happening with Russian energy. And you know, early December there was the EU ban on Russian crude. And then in February, there was an EU ban on Russian products. Um, so this, all this, this material we, we said at the start of the year um, on previous episodes, like, comment, subscribe, um, was that Russian energy would still flow. It just would take a new path. Um, we've seen India buying a lot. You know, I won't, I've mentioned them a lot, I think, every week, you know, how much India are buying. Um, we've touched on enforcement of refined Russian crude. Can it be imported into the EU? We touched on that. We touched on how much China are buying, Latin America and West Africa. I didn't see, though, I didn't see the Azores being an STS area for Russian crude. I excuse my ignorance there. I did not see a small archipelago owned by Portugal being a convenient location for Russian energy to ship to ship. And that's what we're seeing, you know, not not big volumes, but it's it's more it's the significance of this um was where it is geographically. I mean you look and it's middle of the Atlantic. I know you're gonna talk about all things maritime in a moment to do with why it's quite calm there, but you know, leave them alone. You know, it's the Azores, you know, that and then there's this this armada of Russian sewers maxes ship to ship in euros so it's 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 the significance of the location not not the volumes that are going on but it's uh, that's not insignificant either so yeah um all things kepler raises all things interesting uh northeast atlantic basin hello portugal for russian energy well i think as you were saying that the the, the point that they're all doing their activity on is roughly about 100 to 120 nautical miles south of the island southwest of the islands so it puts you kind of smack dab in the middle of the lower uh, westerlies which yeah like, like napoleon yeah uh, so when you look at the way that the currents and the winds flow winds usually flow to the west from the east in that location because you're in the lower ocean currents also kind of flow in that general direction but generally speaking the weather there is fairly benign and fairly calm you don't really have a lot of storms that build up because there's not a lot of uh, uh, fetch, i.e. distance from landmass to water mass, which would cause a storm to build up and become massive. I mean, it is the birthplace of, or not near the birth, but it's just north of the birthplace of where most hurricanes start off the Cape Verde Islands. Um, but nevertheless, they come across mainly as thunderstorms and rain, not as massive uh, windstorms because they need to build up thermal energy as they go across the ocean. So you're in a, you're kind of in a sweet spot um weather wise so when you look at it from a from a uh, logistics standpoint you know the typical flow for waterborne crude out of out of uh, russia into europe was from um the baltics into the ara refining sector and that was basically a two-day trip in 
one day discharging, two day trip back to reload. So now you've added an extra two and a half days, both from the outbound and the inbound leg, because you're going to south of the Azores. Um, so now you can say that from a supply chain standpoint, it becomes a much more manageable supply chain, especially as now we're out of winter where you require an ice class vessel. Uh, ice class vessels being vessels that are certified to operate under different ice conditions. You know, we're yep. out in the middle of May. There's no ice in the North Sea, nor no ice in the Baltic Ocean. Therefore, any ship can do this transportation flow. And therefore, they can keep moving crude out at a regular basis and not disrupt their own production inside of the country. But it just adds more ton miles at the end of the day because you are adding an extra six, seven days to a voyage that normally would be four to five. So, what, so, yeah, I mean, look, that crude is not going back, just to be clear, the crude isn't going back into Northwest Europe, though, to feed the refineries. It's going elsewhere across the world. Yeah, from that point, it's probably, you know, they're probably using a larger vessel like a VLCC <clears throat> as yeah. a floating storage tanker, and then they just bring alongside Suez Maxes, they load out. And so you end up moving, you know, 150 KT parcels every couple of days off of your floating terminal, your VLCC. Yeah, if only there was a way to track those cargo movements. If um, only there was a system, yeah. a company that attracted that data from the market, from the from the ether. To Genius be, idea, though. It'd be yeah. an interesting concept. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, no, no, that's. I just, just wanted to raise raise <laughs> that because, I, I to be honest, if I'm honest with you, I don't think this is a. I don't think this story will ever ever cease to. Um, evolve you know now we're talking about the azores middle of the atlantic that's the current location we've seen kalamata offshore greece we've seen um uh north north africa in general being sort of a hub for russia i, I i'm pretty sure that it would that that sort of circus will just continue to move well once the, the eyes are on it it will just move to a new place but then you even look at the penetration of clean products into south america from russia yeah you know, South America was primarily an import market for U.S. Gulf Coast produced products. Yeah. But now that the Russian products are discounting and trying to find a home, they're actually displacing U.S. products out of a lot of the South American markets, thus making the U.S. have to find alternative locations to go with their exports out of the Gulf Coast. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, it's, it's a similar story for, you know, talking about where, where people are being displaced, because it's not just... You know, the story here as well is not just who is doing it, but who isn't doing it. You know, when you mentioned there, Latin America are buying gas oil from Primorsk, which they have done. I've sold gas oil into Argentina in the past. It it does work, especially for the cold winter properties. But it, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the overriding story about, okay, the Gulf Coast refiners aren't doing it. So they have to be competitive in other markets they necessarily weren't in before. And it's a similar story in this region, East Africa. You know, buying a lot of, the, you know, it really is a growth area. It's something that everyone was talking about last week during the MPGC conference. Um, and we just, we touched on it as well last week on the on the show. But, it, you know, if you're a Middle East refiner and you're used to selling material into East Africa and then suddenly this Russian oil is cheaper, then you've got to also be competitive. So it's it's a, it's a, I would say that there won't be one set one set set of dynamics about what happens with Russian energy. It's a constantly evolving machine. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's one that everyone's got to keep an eye on, I think. Well, and, and it is a case of economics trumping uh, politics at some point, because, you know, if, if somebody's willing to give you oil at, uh, you know, 30, $40 a ton discounts to what you can buy alternatively, uh, and you're a country that is not, uh, um, you know, in the first world, you know, you're a developing nation, mm. that cheap energy goes a long way and uh, it helps your population better than anything else. So that's why well, that's right. you see that yeah. still happening. And those yeah. will be hard to stop. Um, but nevertheless, you know, speaking of Atlantic, keeping the focus on the Atlantic Basin, mm. uh, one of the points to touch on, especially with changing flows, um, is the startup of the anticipated Dangote refinery in Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, the Dangote refinery is a greenfield plant that was built by the Dangote Corporation, $21 billion price tag on that puppy when all things were said and done. So that's about $12 billion over budget, the initial budget. I think Not bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool yeah. Uh, and, and nevertheless, that it's a 620,000 barrel a day behemoth 
uh, which is going to upend even the uh, current status quo within the West African region and the flows of crude oil as well as the flow of products. Yeah, look, um, yeah, it's a few things here, but you know, first of all, you know, I, I I spent a lot. I've spent a lot of time in Nigeria. I've worked for Nigerian trading companies in the past. I've got a lot of very good friends there. The overriding thing for me is I'm pleased. I'm over the moon that Dan Goti had the vision to build it. He had the 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 investments. He had all the approvals, and that Nigeria is will be self sufficient on gasoline and subsidized products. That and it's been it's been the sort of the food that has fueled uh, corruption in the region it, and, and Nigeria, especially. So I think it's a great step forward for Nigeria and for West Africa in general. Um, now, whenever there is a change in circumstance like that, um, you can bet your life that people will want to fight against it. So I think that that is, that is a, a constant uh, battle that the Dangote group will have to go through. But essentially, it's a very good thing. And, you know, whether it, when it will start operations, you know, I know they had the commissioning last week, but Buhari, the outgoing president, was there cutting the, cutting the, the, the tape. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very good thing. When they start producing, we don't, no one knows yet. But um, it's certainly a game changer for the gasoline market, trading market in, you know, Europe, Middle East and Africa. Well, I would think that they would start actually getting volumes out of the refinery within the next month or so. So, uh, you know, Nigeria, the NNPC has said they're going to stop importing uh, through their crude exchange program at the end of Q3. So that means that they know that they're going to get start getting some volumes. But when you look at the plant, when she gets to full operational status, 300,000 to 320,000 barrels a day of gasoline will be coming out of the plant. Euro 5 compliant, which means it meets all the current regulatory needs into all the West African nations. Um, yeah. and it does meet the majority of Nigeria's demand profile. Uh, it's about 120,000 a day of gas oil coming out of the plant, which again will be ULSD E9, E590 compliant, uh, which again will meet all the demand needs plus extra for Nigeria as well. Yeah. Nevertheless, you're looking at something that's going to basically cut the import demand into West Africa as a general region in half uh, once it's fully operational and fully running. Uh, yeah which you know basically puts pressure back on the european refining sector because the majority of the barrels that were coming into west africa were being sourced from european refineries uh primarily in the north northwest europe refineries to be, to be exact not the mediterranean uh, so the likes of your refineries in antwerp uh yeah. rotterdam amsterdam and to some extent the uk will start to feel the pinch on the lack of that uh, outlet for their product yeah it's not it's not a good story for um yeah if you're a, a complacent trader who's always relied on that short yeah it's a it's a game changer for the non-oxy gasoline market but um i, 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 I i'm not also, sure also, i don't also, think we'll see anything come out of there until q4 well we gotta watch that space <laughs> yeah we have <laughs> I, I think, I, I think I, i'm pretty i i feel confident that they you know when you put $21 billion down into a plant, you want to make that thing run and start retaining, your, your, get your earnings back. I mean, absolutely. But back. So I think they have an incentive to get it to run. I think the Nigerian government has an incentive to make sure that it runs and stabilizes because at the end of the day, it becomes a net positive for their uh, foreign reserves. Um, oh, of course. I mean, everything oh, yeah. they've been doing in the past has always drained their foreign reserve accounts because they've had to give away crude and buy product back on U.S. dollar basis. Yeah. Um, and then trade it back into their own currency in the Naira. And that exchange has always been a problematic thing to fix. Mm. Um, so being able to take in, you know, have local crude produced and sold in the local currency basically removes the sucking sound of the of their foreign reserves. Absolutely. Look, of course, it's a no-brainer. You know, all of it is a no-brainer. They've got their own crude. The refining sector has been down for the last two decades. Um, you know, they weren't able to... As I said, subsidized oil products in a in a market that has struggled with political conflicts and corruption. It's a no brainer. Absolutely, I, I, no one can argue with that. It's twenty one billion dollars. It's years and years in the making, probably a decade now. You're not just going to want to say, right? Suddenly, we need to sell all this gasoline and stuff. It, 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 it will be measured, and it has to be measured because 
you only get the opportunity to make a first impression once. And I think what they want to do, they want to do it properly, and they will not rush that CDU. Um, we, 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 I, again, I, I don't think I don't think we'll see anything until Q4. Um, but let, let's keep our eye on it. So, but when you look at it from a freight perspective, I mean, the changes that are going to need to happen, you'll lose all the MR flow that would be going in. So you're basically, now you have to think about where do these MRs go. Now, if you couple that with the Russian flow into South America displacing U.S. exports, mm. it almost makes it where Europe becomes a U.S. dumping ground for all exports out of the U.S. Gulf Coast. At that. Yeah, yeah that, it's, that's where we go back to that, that cliche. It's not who is doing it, it's who isn't. And, you know, with, with market dynamics shifting completely, you know, with like, like just what you just highlighted, that material needs to go somewhere and it, what it is it's not bullish gasoline cracks um I, 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 look it's i don't know it's it's a difficult one and it's a it's an, a, an ever evolving situation yeah because if you look at it from a balance point of view i mean the u.s government the u.s gulf coast refiners have to get rid of the excess material or cart runs and i don't think in the current environment anybody wants to go through the political uh, mailstorm of announcing run cuts when you have margins so good yeah. Uh, the incentive they're going to have is to try to export as much as they can and push it out the other side of the gates because the inland logistics from uh, Gulf Coast refineries is fairly constrained uh, when you actually think about it. The Jones Act puts one big constraint on the waterborne movements, and most of your pipeline systems, your Colonial Pipeline, your Explorer Pipeline, the Wolverine Pipeline, um, you know, they're all at capacity for clean products, so you don't really have uh, you know, extra places to put oil internally into the United States. But nevertheless, if you start exporting material into Europe, you know, Europe, conversely, then has to export their excess material no longer to West Africa. But that just opens up the East Coast United States as the place where all those barrels need to go. Yeah. And so if you, if you do shift 300,000 barrels a day out of West Africa into the United States East Coast, um, I mean, you're, you're looking at a complete change in trade flow and it pretty much puts downward pressure on the entire e, uh, U.S. gasoline complex going into q3 q4 yeah um, i mean if you're if you're a trader what you're hoping for is a very busy atlantic hurricane season yes which unfortunately those forecasts don't look too strong right now well <laughs> literally that's right anyway um <laughs> but so the, other side, the other flip side of dan Godi's refinery which is something i haven't seen a lot of is is actually the crude availability because if you look at the contract that they've signed with an MPC, and MPC has the rights for 300 to 400,000 barrels a day of crude into the refinery, leaving mm -hmm. Dangote with the additional uh, one, 300 to 200,000 that he has to buy on the spot market. But that basically starts putting pressure on your TD20, your Suez Max, because you're losing 300,000 barrels a day potentially of crude exports out of Nigeria. You are. It's, but you've got to, yeah, you mentioned earlier on about putting things into context, i.e. five-year average. We've got to bear in mind that Nigeria's exports are about one and a half million barrels a day at the moment, a lot lower than what they're capable of. Now, is that an OPEC story or is it a lack of investment and, you know, what's been happening with the Nigerian infrastructure in terms of... I think of that's, that's the story of Nigerian infrastructure attacks and nobody's able to keep a steady system running because... Of the of the robbery that's right that happens and then the you know initially someone's pipeline pull tap explodes and that shuts down a field for a month as they have to rebuild a pipeline exactly exactly so i i, I don't know it's if you know to bola tinubu will be sworn in as president soon will that i i don't i don't know will, will that help infrastructure investment will that appease the the people who are uh, you know are, are protesting etc and causing these causing these disruptions but you say we get nigerian production back to say two i mean it's always sort of above two around there that's what they're capable they're capable of a lot more but let's say it goes to two million it's a much different argument than when you're at one and a half yes it is it really is yeah so i don't know look, look i mean we've got we've got an opec meeting coming up this week um i i mean i'm moving quickly on because i'm conscious of time but same, 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 you see? Um, I think so. I think OPEC will have a hard time making it an official production quota cut through, across the members. Yeah. Now, does that mean Saudi Arabia and UAE don't cut any more? Well, they could potentially cut some more. 
but do they really want to start subsidizing everybody else within OPEC plus? Yeah. So the underlying issue that OPEC plus has had is they have not ever produced at the announced quota level. They're still below the quotas. Yeah. So even with the 3.6 million barrels that they have cut since November of last year, or was it October of last year, they're still not at their quotas. Um, yeah. So it does say that, you know, basically, you know, the world looks at the quota level and looks at the actual production levels. And even with the actual production levels, we've got weakening structure in Brent, weakening structure in WTI, which shows that demand is not as strong as people want to say it is, at least in the current market. Yeah. In no, look- our turnaround season, that's yeah. coupling demand. But nevertheless, OPEC's got to look at that and say, do they really believe their own forecast on China? Because OPEC is forecasting a huge Chinese increase in demand or Asian increase in demand going forward in the second half of the year. If they do believe those arguments, then they really can't afford to cut anything. So if they cut now, they're cutting into July production. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it's, it's, yeah. And so that's going to be a big, interesting thing to look at because if, the, if they cut for their July liftings, then that puts a lot of shade on what Chinese demand or Asian demand really is going to look like. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, I, I think it will be maintain course. I mean, there was some aggressive nar- uh, narrative coming out of Prince Abdulaziz last week, you know, the Saudi energy minister, about wanting speculators to keep on ouching. I'm not sure that's helpful, if I'm honest. I, I mean, why, 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 why make that job? I don't know, but uh, look, where oil is now, where Brent is. I mean, it was only at the start of May that oil was getting close to breaking 70. And now it's sort of settled, you know, I'd say the average this month is probably around 75, something like that. So I'd, I'd argue that that's kind of a Goldilocks point for OPEC. And I think that they'll watch what Russia are doing. And, you know, Saudis will be there to sort of, uh, you know, mitigate anything there. I, I don't think that they will continue to just bail people out who aren't. Um, who are laggards on the cuts, but essentially, I think it's uh, it's same same. Yep, no, I think so too. I think you know other things that people are going to be watching this week. It's going to be hot on everybody's mind is the uh, U.S. debt ceiling talks. Uh, you know, there's there is a framework agreement that was announced on Saturday. Now it has to go through the whole rigmarole of passing through Congress. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know who knows <laughs> how that's going to make this this actually land when it comes to an actual vote, but. Uh, you know, they're going to try to have a vote in the House of Representatives on Wednesday, which is a big push, and then have a follow-up vote by Thursday or Friday in the U.S. Senate. And then hopefully yeah. if there's no major adjustments or amendments, gets to the president's desk before D-Day, which is currently June 5th. Yeah. And then I think you could see quite the relief rally after that. So I think that's one to definitely keep an eye on. Yes. No, I think that's definitely – there'll they'll definitely could be a pop in the markets on that one. Um, you know, we've got Chinese PMI data we already talked about coming out this week. We've got non-farm payrolls on Friday, yeah. which will be an interesting one to look at as well, because the market's now thinking the Fed might actually increase rates again. Yeah. Um, so what it's not, like? you know, we've gone from pivot to reducing rates to now do nothing and increase rates. Um, at least that because the data coming out of the U.S. still shows inflation moving higher and yeah. rate growth moving higher. And um, that just means that uh, the wage uh, wage growth inflation spiral keeps moving on. Yes, sir. All right. Happy but, uh, Tuesday. Like, happy comment, Tuesday, subscribe. everybody. Like, comment, and subscribe. Happy trading. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Ciao.